Good morning, Gathering Place family. So good to be with you today. I'm in what's going to be our new gym here at the Gathering Place. We really do feel like God's called us to minister to the whole person, spirit, soul, and body. And so this is just a little bit of a, a sneak peek into something that's in development here at the Gathering Place. I'm excited about it. There's going to be more information coming up soon. In fact, today, February 28th, is the final weekend of our first year here at the Gathering Place, at least the first year for me and my family. And so I really do feel like we are at a point where we are ready to uh, turn the page. We're ready, we're ready to turn the corner as far as the development and some of the things that are happening here at the Gathering Place. So much has been done, but I can't wait to share with you some of the things that I really feel like God has put on my heart over this past season and just celebrate what he's done over the past year as well. Well, today I want to get into the Bible with you. And so if you do have your Bible, pull it out and uh, we're going to take notes. We're going to do something a little bit different today. You know, so many people know a lot about the Bible, but they don't exactly understand what the Bible is all about. And I think that this is probably the most sold book in the world, most um, most copies of this have been produced than, than any other book, but it might be the least read book. And one of the reasons for that is I think people have a hard time just understanding it or knowing how to read the Bible. And so I'm going to take some time with you today to uh, just give an overview of what this is that we hold in our hands. It's not an ordinary book. It's not just, it's not just an inspirational book, a, a historical book. It's, it's not just a poetic book. It's not just something that is religious in nature, but it's really the Word of God, the living Word of God. And when you start to get an understanding of how it's all put together, you find out this is a powerful book. So without further ado, I want you to open in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. There Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, Be diligent to show yourself approved, a workman who does, approved to God, who, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So in the old King James Version, it says, be, study to show yourself approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's something about getting into the word of God that's, um, and rightly dividing the word and understanding it that makes a huge difference for us. And I think God wants that for us. He wants us to understand what it is that we're reading, what we're looking at. So I'm going to actually give you a, a little bit of an overview of the Bible that you hold in your hands. Uh, so this might be for some of you very basic, and I hope it is because we need to get a basic understanding of, of the Word of God. And so let's open this up together and uh, first of start with this. What is the word Bible, <laughs> right? Let's go that basic. Let's go that basic. The word Bible, it just means book. And this is the book. This is the book right here. It's not just an ordinary book. In fact, it's really a compilation of about 66 different books or, or documents written by over 40 different authors on three different continents over a, a period of about 1,500 years. So it's not just an ordinary book with one author who wrote the whole thing from start to finish. In this book, in the Bible, there's a number of different genres. There's poetry, there's history, there's prophecy, there's just straight doctrine and teaching. So it's not just one style of writing the whole way. And that's important because you will read certain portions of it and you might want to think that you know, we should read the Bible literally. But you can't read the whole Bible literally because it's not all literal. You can't read the whole Bible metaphorically because it's not all metaphor. There's, like I said, there's prophetic words. Some of those have been fulfilled. Some of those are yet to be fulfilled. Some of those have been partially fulfilled. Some of it is really just poetic and it's inspirational in nature, for sure. And some of it is just straight up literal. Thou shalt not murder, right? There's no metaphor for that. It just means don't go around killing people. Okay, so there's a number of different genres uh, or styles of writing contained within the Bible. And, and the topics of the Bible, it covers from uh, Genesis to Revelation, from creation to the fall of man to the redemption to the you know Jesus to the, the uh, cross death resurrection to the birth of the early church all the way to in Revelation where it talks about 
the recreation. If you were to put a theme of the whole Bible together, you'd find in Genesis chapter uh, 3, where the fall of man happens, and, and so you had the first couple chapters where God was with man and everything was good. And then you get at the other bookend, Revelation, you see that being recreated where God is with man again. And so everything in between is about God getting back that relationship and that closeness to man. And that's fulfilled in Revelation at, at the very end. And so that's kind of the overarching theme of the Bible. But the Bible is known as progressive revelation. So what does that mean? Progressive revelation just means that more and more details emerge in the story. So it's not just in Genesis chapter 1 where he lays out everything that's ever going to be revealed. But God continues to reveal, reveal more about himself, his plan, our nature, how things work, all the way through scripture till you get to the end. And it ultimately it climaxes with Jesus and his life, his death and resurrection. That is what the whole Bible is leading up to for the most part. It's getting to that point. And so overall theme of the Bible, what we're looking at, Jesus saving us, Jesus saving us. And you see that from the Old Testament, the need for salvation. You see him coming to save us. And then you see him forming a new people in the New Testament as well. It's kind of like a TV show. You ever watch a TV show where in that show, there's the overarching theme of the whole show. But each little series to that ha has its own little challenge and, uh, and victories and cliffhangers as well. And, and there's character development that takes place in those stories. You, see, you have the hero, right? The hero's journey who he's faced with a conflict and he either backs down or he stands up or, or he fails. And then there's this battle going on. And overall, there's this epic battle that's happening that's even bigger than that single story. That's kind of what the Bible is like. It, it has that single story, each little book in there, and the different characters who show up. But overall, there's the big picture story of Christ coming to save us. That's what it's after. Now, in the Bible, there's two Testaments. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. And a testament isn't a word that we use very often, but a testament, a testament is like a promise. It's like a contract. It's, it's really a covenant. So it's more than just a pinky promise. It's more than just a contract in our sense because, because God is committing to it and he's committing his life to it. And when we enter into testament or covenant with God, we, you know, we have the, the laws, we have the uh, obligations, we have the commitments, we have all of that. And uh, we say, man, we are committing to this till death, right? Sort of like marriage uh, used to be, should be, still is. <laughs> but it's a, it's a promise. And so the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and then the New Testament, that's how it's divided. Now, in the Old Covenant, there's 39 books. In the New Testament, there's 27 books. The Old Testament is way bigger than the New Testament. And so it's going to take you a little bit longer to read. The Old Testament goes from creation all the way up to about 400 years before Jesus. So you won't see Jesus directly walking around in the scripture with his disciples in the Old Testament. That's in the New Testament. The New Testament covers about a hundred year period and that's after Jesus came. That's once he shows up on the scene and then what happens after. And then it ultimately points to the end times where we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. Maybe soon, maybe before the end of this uh, message here. We don't know about that. But the, let's talk a little bit more about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is focused almost entirely on Israel. So you might hear a lot of people that uh, love Israel today who have never even been there. There is a desire, there's a, there is a care and concern about the nation of Israel. Well, that's because God chose Israel in the Old Testament period here, he chose Israel to be his people, that he would be their God. He gave the other nations of the world up to other gods, to, to lower gods or lesser gods, gods he created. So some, some people would say, well, are, are, they, are they idols or demons? And, and yes, but God is not uh, equal to them. They're not just equal and opposite forces. Uh, God is, our God is the God of all gods. He's the creator God. But he chose Israel to bring uh, a people back to himself so that ultimately, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you follow their lineage. You get to Jesus, the son of God, the savior. So God could also 
ultimately uh, save the whole world. This is happening through um, the Old Testament. And this is why Israel is so important. We learn from Israel. We learn a lot from it. We see ourselves in Israel. We see our ups and downs in Israel. In the Old Testament, we also see the giving of the law. The law is a primary focus in the Old Testament. With the Old Testament law, though, you have to understand something. It's broken down basically into moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law. Not all of it applies to everybody. In fact, the law itself was not given to the whole world. The law was given to the children of Israel. And so for us, we learn from it. We gain principles from it. We can find application in it, but we're not obligated to it. We're not obligated to the ceremonial law. That does not apply to us. Jesus fulfilled that. We're not obligated to the civil law. We're not the nation of Israel. And we are not obligated to the moral law in order to obtain righteousness. However, the moral law, when you read it, you'll see things like you shall not commit adultery. That's part of the moral law. You shall not murder. That's part of the moral law. Those types of things, they apply to us today. But by obeying those things, that isn't what makes us righteous. We'll, turn, we'll learn more about that in the uh, New Testament section. But throughout the Old Testament, you see the expectation, you see the preparation, you see the desire for the Messiah, for the Savior. And that's ultimately fulfilled when we get to the New Testament. So let's talk a little bit about the New Testament. And, and by the way, did I... Well, I'll, I'll go back to this. New Testament here. Uh, it's written after the time of Jesus. It was written um, about how he uh, starts off with the Gospels, how Jesus came, how he lived, how he died, how he rose again. Like I said, there's 27 books in the New Testament. It was finished by about 100 A.D. So within about, uh, within a generation of Jesus' death and resurrection, the, old, the New Testament was completely written. So it really covers a short amount of time, whereas the Old Testament covers about a 1,400-year period. I'll give you a timeline in just a few moments here. But it was written directly to us. So the Old Testament should, should be something we learn from, we, we, we glean from, we spend time reading. But our primary focus as Christians is really in the New Testament. So they're both valuable, and I don't say dis, be dismissive of the Old Testament at all, not one bit. But the New Testament is where, where we need to put our focus. It's where we get the most application, uh, the most direction for how we live as followers of Christ. And so we need to focus more time on there. Now, for some of you, you like, you like us to outline things. <laughs> you like it when it's just like, hey, give me, give me a... Give me this in order. So let's do a little bit of an outline for the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, 39 books. The first 17 books are historical books. This is important because the Old Testament isn't written like one long book where you read it from Genesis to Malachi and it all just makes sense. It's not all in, uh, in, in order. They're not all in order that way. They don't follow the timeline in that manner the whole way through. But the first 17 books, for the most part, do follow a timeline or an order. And so you have the first five books of the Bible, speaking, you know, starting off with Genesis. And in there, in fact, in the first, first 11 chapters of Genesis, this is kind of how it works. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you have creation. You have everything being good. You have this, the sin of man. You have the, and the subsequent fall of man. You have the flood. You have all of that happening right there in those first 11 uh, chapters of Genesis. And then it turns a corner when we meet a person named Abe, Abraham, <laughs> Father Abraham, right? And from that point on, throughout the end of the Old Testament, it's really an emphasis or a focus on Abraham and his descendants. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's kind of the storyline of, of their lives and those who followed after them, who became ultimately the nation of Israel, was birthed out of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons, and through them, the entire nation of Israel was birthed. So that is where the whole... Uh, Old Testament kind of changes gears. Genesis continues to focus on the life of those three patriarchs or fathers there. Uh, then you get to Exodus. Exodus sounds like this, exit us. 
Exodus is about God pulling his people from slavery and, and forming a nation. Exodus, in Exodus, that's where you have the Ten Commandments. It's where you see a lot of the laws that God gives. And, and what is he doing? He is establishing his people and he is sanctifying them, meaning he is setting them apart from their old way of life and from the nations around them. You get to Leviticus. Leviticus is a book that's kind of hard to read sometimes. Leviticus can be hard to understand. It can be complicated. But what its primary focus is, is on the high priest, the priestly roles. And so as you grow more and study the word and, and really even recognize who Jesus is even more so, you realize how he fulfilled so many of these things that were spoken of in the book of Leviticus. But it really does talk about the ceremonial approach to God, to worship. You get to the book of Numbers. This was written by an accountant. No, just kidding. This is still probably written by Moses. But uh, Numbers gives an account of about the, uh, the uh, 40 years of wandering. Wandering, not wondering. <laughs> Maybe they were wondering too. But they were wandering in the desert. Israel was wandering in the desert. They came out of Egypt, but they had not yet inherited their promised land. And then we get to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means uh, the second giving of the law, the second giving of the law. And, and so you see these first five books, these are oftentimes called the law. They're called the law of Moses, the Pentateuch as well, but they're called the law. Now there's all history and they're for the most part in order of, uh, you know, as things roll out, timeline and so forth, they're sequential. Um, Again, I want to emphasize this, though. As you read in the Old Testament and under those, uh, in those books, you got to realize we are not under those laws. That's not how we become righteous. It just shows us God's righteousness. Uh, in, the, in the scripture there, it shows man's sinfulness. It, it, God gives his instructions on how Israel was to live healthy lives. Uh, you see this, that there's so much foreshadowing of Jesus in the Old Testament in those laws. Okay, so that's just the first five books. And like I said, though, the first 17 books are historical. So you have five, and then the next 12, are, we continue with historical books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, you go, keep going, Esther, um, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. I may have said some of that in in the wrong order. We have Ezra and Nehemiah in there as well, but the remaining 12 of those there, they are historical books. During this time, as Israel becomes a nation, we see that they, they are serving God, then they backslide, and then God starts to <laughs> judge them, and then, and then they repent, and then they're serving God, and then they backslide, and then they s repent, and then they're serving God, and they backslide, and they repent. Does that sound familiar to anyone's life here? <laughs> Maybe uh, we can even see some of our own selves and they're like, man, I'm serving God and doing good. And, and there's ups and downs in our walk with the Lord. And uh, ultimately, God wants to keep us up and he wants to keep us strong and he wants to show himself faithful on our behalf. And he, he even wanted to do that in the life of Israel. That's what he wanted for them as well. But you will see this happening throughout the book of of. Joshua, they enter into the promised land, but they don't quite uh, do everything God's telling them to do. Then we get to the book of Judges, where everyone starts to do what is right in their own eyes. You have the book of Ruth, which shows this loyalty and how someone can uh, be reached who is outside of the covenant. They're outside of the people of Israel. And it's just a picture of the evangelism that takes place even today. You have books like Esther. You know, interesting about a couple books in the Old Testament, by the way, there's two of them that never even mention the name of God. One of them is Esther. Esther is, is a book about uh, the children of Israel who are about to be all wiped out through genocide. And God uses this young lady here to really stand in the gap and advocate for her people. But God's name is never mentioned one time in the book of Esther. Same thing with the book of Song of Solomon. That's just a little Bible trivia for you. Two books in the Bible don't even mention God. Kind of interesting if you ask me. But anyways, the remaining, uh, those 12 books there, they cover about a thousand year period in the life of Israel. They cover about a thousand year uh, period of, of history right there, ending in about 400 B.C., and so that's where it wraps up. There's a, this period between the end of the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, which, which is 
God's considered to be silent. He's not speaking to, in a manner that you know warrants scripture being recorded during that time. So a little bit of a timeline then. Uh, give you an idea when we're reading this, what's happening, when is this happening. In the Old Testament, when you're reading, you see Abraham show up on, on the scene. He shows up in Genesis chapter 11 and then really moving into 12. And that's about 2000 BC. And then we get to the next main character, major character, Moses. He shows up 1400 BC. So there's about a 600 year period before he comes. 400 years after him, we have King David. 1000 BC. And then after King David, you, you read about all these prophets, these Old Testament prophets. They, they show up between about 800 to 400 BC. When you're reading there through the Old Testament, you're going to see that there, there are um, all kinds of genres, like I mentioned. We'll get into poetry next, but let me, let me just say this. I would encourage you, read. When you're reading the Old Testament, you could and you should read the Old Testament books in order from Genesis through Esther. You want to read those first 17 books in order because they do follow a sequential timeline. It doesn't mean you have to read those start to finish without reading any of the other New Testament. But just understand uh, it's best to read those in order, not just jump around if you want to really gain good context for reading the Bible. After we read those first 17 books of history, we get into the five poetic books. And this is Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible. It's probably from the oldest period in the Bible. It's probably written in Abraham's time or before that as well. And the, the theme of the book of Job is that we would trust God always, no matter what happens. We would trust God and we would serve him. You get to the book of Psalms. Psalms is a book of prayers that are sung. This is uh, Israel's worship manual. And it's a great place for you to read through and, and in your walk with the Lord, your daily uh, time with God to, to minister to him and to speak these Psalms out and to pray them and to pray with them and process with them. It shares a lot of uh, like King David's ups and downs and his victories and his, and his defeats. I think the guy had, um, you know, some days he was depressed and beat up, but other days he was on top of the world. Some days he was both. And you see that in the Psalms. You see a real raw relationship with God in the book of Psalms. Uh, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. God reveals his wisdom through the book of Proverbs, 31 chapters there. You can read a chapter every single day. And by the way, out of all the Bible, uh, there's two books that I would say you can just jump around back and forth and pick and choose any direction. That would be Psalms and Proverbs. The rest of them, they're best to read from the beginning of the passage to the end or the beginning of the book till the end of the book. Read them straight through to make most sense. But in Psalms and Proverbs, uh, you can just jump around because it's all good in there and it, and it doesn't all you know, build upon the previous uh, scripture or passage as well. Then you, the final two books, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, the theme of Ecclesiastes is the vanity of life without God. If you're reading through Ecclesiastes and getting discouraged, I'd say <laughs> start maybe read the last chapter first and then go back to the beginning because then you'll see uh, the, the sarcasm that, that shows up in the scripture, you'll understand, oh, this guy isn't just saying give up on God. He's saying, no, life without God is not worth living, so live your life for God. Then we get into Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is, the, it's, it's a book of love. It's a book of, of the story of love between a man and a woman, and it's written like a play. And there's so much that you will, you will see as you discover the New Testament, who Christ is, what he's done, you see really this relationship between Christ and the church as well in the book of Song of Solomon. Okay, so first 17 books, history. Next five books, poetry. Then we get into the prophecy, the prophetic books. So 17 books uh, in the prophetic genre goes from Isaiah to Malachi or for some of you, you call him Malachi, the Italian prophet. Uh, these books honestly can be really um, difficult to understand as well because the prophetic books, oftentimes they're speaking of future events 
within the context of the current, you know, culture, that, that current culture that, that you're reading back in Israel's day. And so as you're reading it, you're, you're some, sometimes wondering, okay, is this something that has already been fulfilled? Is it going to be fulfilled still? Is it partially fulfilled? Is this something that's going to happen, that happened in Israel's time, but in the future when it was written? Did it happen through Christ? Did, is it going to happen at the end of all time? You know, when is it happening? This is what I would recommend to you. Uh, get a good study Bible. Get a good study Bible and just kind of follow along and, and, and look at the notes and, and try to see uh, what others have said and how it all comes together. Because as you're reading these prophetic books, understand this too. Those prophets, they were prophesying in the time of those historical books. And so they actually will line up with different portions of the historical books. That's why I would say read the historical books first before you get into the prophetic books. Uh, as you're reading those there, you'll see, though, pictures of Christ. You'll see pictures of the church. You'll see pictures of yourself in there as well. You know, you'll kind of understand a whole lot more uh, about, about God's overall plan and how he works and how um, even though people sometimes say, well, in the, in the Old Testament, it's full of judgment. Even in those prophetic books that are talking about judgment, there is so much grace and mercy that comes from God and so much patience. So I'd encourage you, read through it, but read through it patiently. And as you do, God's going to show himself strong on your behalf. You're going to see, man, God did it for them. He came through even these people who, who weren't always faithful, but God was always faithful. And he is. So let's get to the New Testament. New Testament, again, 27 books of the New Testament. The first five books, you know what they are? They're history. They're history. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. They're, they are historical books. In the uh, book of Matthew, he's writing primarily to the Jews. The book of Mark, it's all action-packed. If you're ADD, meaning this, uh, you came in late to this message, that's why you're still here, or you checked out, but now you're coming back. You're like you turned this on, but now you've been getting coffee, you've been going and, and, and getting your breakfast and walking around and doing your laundry or doing whatever else. Start with the book of Mark. The book of Mark is great for you because it's all action. The book of Luke really emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. The book of John emphasizes the divinity of Jesus. And by the way, those first three books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called the Synoptic Gospels, meaning they're very similar. They'll have a lot of the same stories in there. But the book of John, though it includes some of those, it shows he, he includes a lot that did not show up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so those four books really record the life of Jesus, and they're called the Gospels. Then we get to the book of Acts, also a historical book. It's the fifth book of the New Testament. In the book of Acts, this is the giving of the Holy Spirit that takes place here. And the book of Acts covers the first 30 years of the church. First 15 years or so is the birth of the church there in Jerusalem and how it slowly starts to spread out. Uh, and then the last 15 years, it covers really the ministry of Paul primarily and how the gospel begins to spread outside of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so this is what's happening in the book of Acts. And so you see the, the early church being formed there. Well, this is a new church. This is a new people. God is taking his people, his elect, his, his chosen, his, those who would respond to the gospel, those who received their Messiah, those who are now born again. They, they are a new people. They're almost like a new nation. And so with that, in the same way that the children of Israel came out of bondage and slavery from Egypt into ultimately their promised land, God said, there is a new way of living for you. Well, for us as Christians, there is a new way of living for, for us as well. And so how do we know what way to live? It's found in the epistles or letters. So from Romans all the way till we get to the book of 3 John, it's all about uh, letters from God, this instruction from him. And so just to go through, I won't go through all 20, all, all the rest of these here, but you have, for example, Romans. Romans is a book of theology. It, it, it takes out uh, the Old Testament. It takes the Old Testament 
and lays it all out and puts it together and says, all that was written back there, this is what it means to us today. This is how uh, it applies to us today. This is how it was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. This is what you are not responsible for. This is what you are responsible for. This is the new way of living. This is how we believe as Christian. It explains all, all of that. These letters are written to the church so they can understand. Romans is one of the best uh, places to read to get a good overview of Christianity, Christian faith and belief. Then you get to the Corinthians, two of them, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, it really talks about how to live uh, in love and in unity. There's so much about the, the Spirit of God moving in that church there, but the focus is, man, we've got to serve other people. 2 Corinthians also really focuses on servanthood as well, putting others first. We get into Galatians. Galatians talks about being saved by grace and how it that's how it's always been, that it's, it's by grace through faith that we're saved. You get into Ephesians and Colossians. They are books that are general epistles or general letters that are written to the churches. So uh, they're not just addressing specific things in those local congregations, but they're written to the whole church. And in them, you read some similarities, but you also see that Paul is saying, hey, make sure this is read among the other churches as well. You'll continue on, and, and uh, Philippians, a book again about, about uh, serving, really. You see Thessalonians, Paul's talking to him about the return of Christ. Then we get into the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, where he's writing to young pastors, and he's just telling them how to lead and how to conduct uh, the life of the church, how to put all that together. You get to the book of, of Philemon. Philemon is, is the anti-slavery book in the Bible. And it really talks about how to receive someone who was a slave, but now that Christ came, they're no longer to be treated as slaves, but as our brother. And so it's a great book. It's a little one. It's a quick little read there. Uh, but it really does tell us that there, this is a new way of living. We treat people different. You continue on and you see things like James, Peter, and John. These are some of the uh, guys who were with Jesus in the beginning. And as they're writing, they're like, James is a kick in the pants. I mean, literally, like if you're taking uh, grace for granted, you read the book of James and it'll tell you, get your butt in gear. You see Peter, he's giving a lot of warnings. He's talking about false teachings that are coming in. He's giving his insight as an older man, however old he was. He he was young when he met Jesus, and he was uh, ultimately martyred for his faith for Christ. And then we see John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. It's all the same John. It's just different letters. And in that, he's writing to the church, and he talks about love. He talks about warnings for uh, false teaching and, and so on. Finally, we get to the one prophetic book of the New Testament, and that's the book of Revelation. In there... We're looking forward to the culmination of all things as God wraps it all up. You see what's to come. You see judgment. You see redemption. And ultimately, you get this picture of a new heaven and a new earth. Finally, I want to talk to you about this. Since we have an overview of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, again, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. We have history, we have poetry, we have prophecy in the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament we have history, we have instruction, which could be called doctrine, uh, the, the epistles, and then we have the prophecy as well. Uh, you look at that, how should I read the Bible then? Because so often people will just open it up and read from Genesis to Revelation, but they really don't do that because they get to about the fifth chapter of Genesis and they run into a genealogy, and then they think, I have no idea how to even pronounce these names, us and guz and buzz and, you know, all these things. And they get discouraged. And, and that's too bad because so often they quit right there. So let me talk to you about how to read the Bible. Here's number one. Write this down. Read the Bible patiently. <laughs> Be patient. Don't give up. Just take it slow. Read the Bible plainly. What do I mean by that? Have you ever heard people say things like, you guys take the Bible literally, or you shouldn't take it literally, or you should take it literally, or it's all metaphor, this and that. And 
whenever somebody says that, it's because they probably don't read in general. Because you don't read the Bible literally, of course, unless it's written literally. But again, there's so many different genres. There's so many different uh, things that the Bible says. So when it says that God covers you under his wings, does that mean that God's a chicken? You know, if we're reading it literally, we think God, God has feathers. So when Jesus says, I am, I am the door, do we think that Jesus is sitting there on hinges? You know, if you're reading it literally, no, Jesus has hinges. No, and he's about to come unhinged if we keep saying things like this. No, the reality is this, that there are portions to read literally. There are portions to read as metaphor. There are other portions but that, that we read in the, with the different genres, but just read it plainly, meaning read it for what it is. Take it for what it is and don't make it something that it's not. Uh, read the Bible. I'd say this. I, I said, don't read it straight through from Genesis to Revelation, but do read portions straight through. So if you're going to read, uh, don't pick and choose verses and jump around. I love the promises of God. I think we should hold on to the promises of God. But don't read the Bible for promises. Just, oh, I want this promise, I'm going to pick that promise, I'm going to pick that promise. You're going to miss what God is saying to you. So it's not a fortune cookie that you just find a promise and you pull it out. You want to read it so you can get the context, so you can get the heart of God. You can understand not just the works of God, but the ways of God as well. Uh, so read a book or passage from start to finish when you are reading. Read a book from start to finish. You know, put your bookmark in if you can't get all the way through at that time. But uh, don't just jump around in it. When you do uh, read the Bible, I, I would encourage you, get a study Bible. Get a study Bible that has good introductions to the passages. That get, has some good notes on it, some good commentary. Some of the stuff that they say it might be really helpful. Other parts, it might not be exactly 100% accurate because it's just that. It's commentary on the Bible, and they're trying to help you understand it. And there may be some other ways of looking at it. But as you learn, as you study, you're going to find that to be very helpful. You'll get a better grip on what God is saying. When you get to portions, though, like genealogies, uh, don't give up in them. Just skim through them. If there's parts that you don't understand, just skim through it. You know, read a study guide, but just skim through it. Come back to it later. You will understand more of it later. There, there will probably be portions uh, of the Bible that you thought you understood, and then as you reread it and learn more, you'll realize, oh, I missed a lot. There's a lot that I still don't understand yet. I mean, it's a big book, and it's revealing the heart of God. Just don't let that be discouraging. For example, you read the genealogies, and there's a lot of them in there, up until the time of Christ, by the way, after Christ, it doesn't matter. But up until the time of Christ, it does. But at first, you're reading about someone else's storyline. But eventually, you'll see yourself in there too. You'll see yourself in there. So as you read the Bible, know this. There are some things that are difficult to understand. But the most important truths that you need to know for a relationship with God, for salvation, to secure your eternity with Him in heaven, how to live uh, with His presence in your life here on earth. The most important truths in the Scripture are easy to understand. And God speaks through about them. He reveals them over and over. He, he talks about it from different angles. You're going to get it. If you have this understanding of the Bible, now when you start to open it up, you get a better picture of, oh, this is what I'm reading here. This is why it's written. This is how it applies to me. It just gives you an advantage. It's no longer a foreign book, but it's really a book that belongs to you. This is, this is your team's playbook. And so you understand where you're at in there, what's going on, and uh, what you're to do about it as well. Well, I hope that you found that encouraging and it's just helpful with the Word of God. I want to tell you this. Whatever you do, whatever you get out of what I shared today, read your Bible. God wants to speak to you. Well, next week we're going to start talking about how the gathering place is turning a corner and some of the exciting things that I really do believe God is developing here. I hope to see you in person at 930 at our campus or right here online where we release this every Sunday morning at 930 a.m. Until then, live out your faith more than Sunday.